Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Lisa, for that really powerful prayer and reading of Scripture. I invite you to think now of two leaders. I think I might have told this uh, story before, but I will say it again. Leader A lifted an entire nation in a time of despair. He mobilized his people against unimaginable odds with a clear vision and inspiring passion. He launched a movement that has impacted literally everyone alive today. He set in motion an industrial and scientific revolution that produced the first computer, the first jet plane, began the human exploration of space, and unlocked the mystery of nuclear energy. Almost every aspect of the modern world has, in one way or another, been influenced by this man. By the time he died at the age of only 56, everyone on the planet knew his name. Without a doubt, Leader A changed the world. Leader B lived during the same era. In fact, he died just 21 days before Leader A, but his life was very different. At the height of his influence, Leader B ran a school with just 100 students. He wrote a few books, but was not really widely regarded. He was beloved by his friends and family and had a reputation for being both intelligent and faithful, but at the time of his death, almost no one knew his name. And most considered his life's work unfulfilled, including Leader B himself. So given the choice, which one of these two leaders' strategies would you rather study? Whose life would you want to emulate? Which leadership conference would you rather attend? The one with a keynote address by Leader A, or the one with a small workshop in a small back hall by Leader B? I'll give you 10 seconds to think who you would like to, whose workshop you would like to attend, or whose seminar you would like to attend. If you are inspired by the world-changing effectiveness of Leader A, Congratulations, you have chosen Adolf Hitler. Leader B is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor who was executed by the Nazis for his relentless opposition to Adolf Hitler. Leadership has never been in the spotlight more than in recent months, I think. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need for steady, trustworthy, and capable leadership. Just a few days ago, we saw pictures of the US Capitol being stormed by angry protesters, a mob that resulted in many injuries, damaged property, looting, ransacking, and at least, as far as I've checked, five deaths. A failure in leadership on multiple fronts appears to have led to this outcome. There is also the handling of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, or the handling of public health and safety, with many countries now entering second, third, fourth, or more waves of infection. A breakdown in clear leadership on these fronts has led to serious life-altering experiences for so many. I think we all want good leaders. It is so encouraging to see this morning all of you brave and wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ from this congregation stepping forward to be dedicated to God for His service, answering the call to serve here in St. Kang Methodist Church. I'm sure each of you not only want to be good leaders, uh, not only want good leaders, but you want to be good leaders. You want to be positive, life-changing leaders. So what does a positive, life-changing leader look like in today's post-pandemic world? Our scripture reading sheds some light. There are so many leadership figures in this story. In 14 verses, we're introduced to a few of them. 
Right from the beginning in verse 1 of 2 Kings 5, we are introduced to Naaman, the commander of the Aramean army. Naaman's a great man, highly regarded, the one that has led the Aramean vic- uh, army to victory. He's the man you go to when you want to make things happen. He's politically active, socially connected, a lifetime of medals, parties, receptions, you name it. His work alters the destinies of nations. He appears to be the perfect leader in every way, except he is caught a disease. That disease could mean that he is on permanent stay-home notice. He will be in quarantine for the rest of his life and from the rest of public life. This great warrior, this general, no longer welcome in society. Naaman is a really good analogy for the global situation that we find ourselves in in 2020. Hit by a disease that threatens to completely wreck his life. We'll come back to Naaman later. That's the first picture, or the first picture of a leader that we get. Then there's the king of Aram. Here's another big leader. He's used to getting his way. Naaman, his main man, the man who has won victories on his behalf, is sick. And so the king turns Naaman's sickness, his situation, into an economic and political transaction, as if somehow impressive amounts of silver and gold and garments could buy Naaman's healing. He's like an MP writing a letter that Naaman brings to the king of Israel, except Unlike an MP's letter, the king of Aram turns a formal request into a command. With this letter, he says, I am sending my man to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. To the king, might is right. What good is power if it doesn't bring me any benefits? Power is meant to be grasped to be wielded, to be exploited for my benefit. And so that's the leadership the king of Aram shows. There's yet another leader in this story, the king of Israel. The king of Israel is a somewhat wiser leader. He knows that the power of healing is not the power of kings. His area of expertise is war, killing, and death. And to his credit, he realizes that only God can heal. Hence his lament upon receiving the formal command from the king of Aram. Am I God? Here's a leader who's frustrated and stressed out by the demands of this job. He's so anxious that he cannot see behind this clumsy international relations disaster is actually a sincere desire and longing for healing and health. All the king of Israel sees is more work, more stress, more demand. Look at how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me, the exact words of the king. To the king of Israel, Naaman is not a human being with needs. Naaman is an impossible task, an insurmountable obligation, an unadulterated burden. And even though the king of Israel knows that only God can heal, he never once points Naaman in God's direction. Let's come back to poor Naaman. He arrives at Elisha's house, his entourage of chariots and horses pulling up to Elisha's home. But out comes a servant, to greet him. Not only that, the servant is the middleman. The prophet won't even give him the dignity of a personal audience. Nor does Naaman receive the big televised vaccination injection that he anticipated. Instead, he's asked to dip seven times in the Jordan, rather like an Olympic swimmer being asked to swim laps in a condominium pool rather than that and then in the OCBC arena. Naaman gets angry. 
Do you know who I am? I'm an important man, you know. How can you insult me like this? Doesn't Elisha know that Naaman is a man used to mounting major operations, moving large companies, taking charge of huge projects? Now, as far as portraits of leadership go, I think you agree with me, they all leave very much to be desired. Yet the story of Naaman is in the Old Testament, the richest Old Testament story of baptism. A Gentile convert, an Aramean military general who converts to the faith of Israel. During this period of history, as 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7 will go on to show, Aram is the biggest military threat to Israel. Naaman's conversion is therefore one of the most significant conversion stories in the Old Testament. It contains some of the most sociologically and psychologically rich details of a conversion in Bible. It depicts for us a life-changing event for Naaman. The change of heart and mind and status that can only occur when a sinner encounters the grace of God. There's one more character in this story we have yet to explore. This character, in my reading, is the pivot in this whole story. Without this person, this beautiful story of Naaman's conversion and how Naaman found God would never have happened. In a story full of big time, big position leaders who somehow got it all wrong, here is one who got it all right. Can you guess who this person is? If you don't pay close attention, you might miss it. For such a pivotal role, this person comes onto the scene very early in the story and then is never mentioned again. By now, you should know who I'm referring to. I'm referring to the captive servant girl of Israel. Without her, Naaman's conversion might never have happened. In a world full of big men, it is a little nameless girl who shows us what true Christian leadership can be. This nameless little Israelite girl appears only in verses 2 to 4. She is not on the scene long enough to even earn a nomination for Best Supporting Actor. I'm told. She appears briefly and has only one spoken line in all of the, of the 19 verses that depict Naaman's conversion. And that one spoken line consists of less than 20 words. In fact, much shorter in the Hebrew. After these words, she is done. As far as we know, this may be the only words she ever speaks in history. She says these words and she disappears. Never mentioned again, never remembered. Her small role matches her insignificance as a web or captive of war. She is, after all, merely a servant to the wife of an Aramean general. She's an Israelite in enemy territory. Yet in her vulnerability as a captive in a foreign land, her words challenge the pretensions of the high and mighty leaders and offer hope for God's healing and life. To all of us, as we enter the post-pandemic world, I hope we find a beacon of light in this little nameless girl. She is introduced to us in the story as, literally, a little girl. I know in the, in the translation you, you hear young girl, or what, but the, the word literally means little girl. Little both in age, little both in stature, little both in status. This small female child is placed in a world overwhelmingly dominated by big, important men. Naaman, we are told in verse 1, is literally a great man or a big man. Here is a little maiden. Naaman is a captain. 
the girl is a captive. But her words, which interestingly are the first spoken words in this whole story, are so important that every subsequent action is based on what she is about to say. If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. With these words, she sets off a chain of events that culminates in Naaman's conversion. What kind of words does she offer? Her single line offers no lament, no complaint, no whining, no cursing, no celebration that her captors have been struck by this epidemic. Remember, she is a tiny victim of war in forced servitude. Her words are neither commanding nor tense, giving the relationship between her home country and her master's country. Instead, she expresses a compassionate wish. If only, if only, she wishes for his healing despite his role in defeating her people and taking her captive. In a time of chaos, of disorder and discord, this little girl makes known the power of life that exists among her people. In a time of death and destruction, she focuses her efforts on healing and restoration, pointing the military leader of her enemy towards the only power in the world she knows who can save him. She knew where she came from, Despite her most desperate and painful of circumstances, she would not let allow, she would not let that allow to change who she really was. She was first and foremost a child of the Most High, the sovereign of Israel. She remembered that the prophet of God back home could bring the antidote to the deadly disease. And so she did what all Christians should do. She pointed someone in need in God's direction. Because she does so, by the time we reach the end of the story, both she and Naaman become part of the same family of God. They both recognize and worship the same God. Simply by being a witness to God's divine power and nature, she has led the enemy into becoming a friend, a brother a fellow worshipper. You see, my friends, genuine Christian leadership changes lives for the better. It inspires action. It inspires transformation. Not by power, not by might, but by God's Spirit. All that is needed is to have a heart of compassion, a willingness to point someone in God's direction. There is healing. If only you would go there. This girl has no support group of her own. She is in a household expected to be contemptuous of her faith. She is of the lowest possible status. She has no right to express any of her own opinions and might expect serious consequences for doing so. Yet, somehow, she cannot stay silent. In voicing her faith, she puts in motion a chain of events that brings about an entire change of life. The Bible is full of stories like this. Miriam, the older sister of Moses, negotiates with the daughter of Pharaoh an arrangement that would save her brother from death. David, the shepherd boy comes forward to fight the, Goliath, uh, the, the giant Goliath when every leader around him is shaking in fear. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are just youths in Babylon, but through them, King Nebuchadnezzar comes to witness God's power. The words and actions of this little nameless servant girl show us that God is active everywhere in the world, even deep in the heart of the darkest enemy territory, through you and I, through his people. Anywhere in the world where we are, God's people are, God is at work there. 
the earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. Enemy or not, all belong to Him. God's Spirit is surprisingly present and active, even deep in the heart of exile for this girl. And God's Spirit will be present and powerful through you, even in your weakness and vulnerability. We don't need power or position or prosperity to change someone's life. We don't need to be a king or a general to do so. We just need to be willing to point someone to God. And so I ask you, my brothers and sisters, do you feel helpless in this pandemic? Do you feel small? Do you feel like there are so many more well-qualified, well-recognized people who are more well-suited for the kingdom? Do you feel nameless, voiceless, pointless? Does the, the, the prospect of serving God in this uncertain world fill you with trepidation? If so, take courage. None of those things disqualifies you for leadership in God's kingdom. All you need to do is this. Wherever you are, compassionately and courageously voice your belief that there is a force for life and healing more powerful than any political party, advocacy group, business corporation, or army. As you do so, my brothers and sisters, may the world find in you a blessing. May they find through you the powerful, life-giving God who changes lives, changes destinies, changes everything forever.